This evening we have Dr. Anne Bunnell, presently the president of the Leicester Astronomical Society with a lifelong and broad interest in all aspects of the subject. She's a chemist by profession. Many years ago, she worked in the chemistry department at Wuhan University in China, a long time before anybody in this, <clears throat> anyone in this country had ever heard of Wuhan. So please, can you all put your hands together in the Mexburn Swinton way and welcome Dr. Anne Bunnell. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Well, um, thank you very much for the invitation to um, speak to you. I think I have spoken to your society before, but it was in the, the dim and distant past, I think, when you just got uh, uh, going. And I do seem to recall that I was invited to the uh, opening of your observatory. And I can tell you how long ago it was, because uh, my husband and I came up there uh, with our son, who was in his pushchair at the time, and he's now sort of 28, nearly 29. So uh, <laughs> it was uh, was some time ago, OK? And um, yes, uh, you know, talking about my, my connection with uh, Wuhan. Uh, yes, um, one time when I told people I'd been at Wuhan in China, no one had ever heard of it, but sadly everyone has now. And um, I'm a bit annoyed as well, because um, this new variant of the virus, people are calling it the Kent virus or the Kent mutant. And Kent was where I was born and grew up. So uh, I, I, I really don't know. But anyway, I'm in Leicester now, so I, I don't know quite what's going on there. Anyway, tonight then I'm going to uh, you know, talk to you about some notable uh, women uh, astronomers. And since I first started doing, um, you know, very early incarnations of this, uh, this talk, um, as I said, quite a few years ago, I think the work of some um, women astronomers has become quite well known. So people like Caroline Herschel and um, the um, women who worked at Harvard, the so-called Harvard computers. So I will mention them tonight, of course. Um, but I also want to make you aware of um, the work of some lesser known uh, women. Um, and then... Um, Hopefully it'll inspire you perhaps to go away and research the, uh, the work of, of some of these women and find out about some of them um, uh, your own. And um, as we'll see at the end of the talk, I always try to put a little sort of local interest in when I do this talk to astronomical societies around the country. But um, with Yorkshire, I've drawn a bit of a, uh, a blank, actually. Well, not, not exactly a blank, but I'm hoping that um, some of you will have heard... Um, um, you know, perhaps of some other um, women astronomers who came from uh, Yorkshire, okay? So, um, you know, women in astronomy must be a modern thing, surely. Well, no, it's not, actually, um, because the first person I'm going to talk about um, is Hypatia, and she is generally regarded as perhaps being, um, you know, one of the great founders of women in science in general, and it might be sort of stretching it a bit to sort of call her an astronomer, but we'll see that she did get involved in astronomy. Um, but um, she was actually of Greek origin and she lived in Alexandria in Egypt. And if you look up at the date of her birth, it just says circa 350 to 370. Now, I know some women like to lie about their age, um, but I think, you know, 20 years, um, you know, difference in your date of birth, that's... Um, of asking a bit much of, uh, of people, I think, really. But anyway, she died in 415, okay? And she taught philosophy and astronomy. And um, at the time, you know, she was quite lucky, really, because uh, she came from a very learned family, okay? Her father uh, was Theon of Alexandria, who was a noted mathematician. And some of Hypatia's education was actually in Athens, okay? And she is really one of the well, the earliest a female mathematician scientist whose life and work we've got reasonably detailed knowledge about, okay? And obviously though a lot of her work has been lost and variously she's described as a sort of mathematician, a teacher or a philosopher, but she was a very popular teacher and lecturer by all accounts and attracted many students, many students and large audiences. And so what does she do then? Well, she existed uh, edited rather, existing versions of Ptolemy's Almagest. She worked on um, various tables um, detailing the positions of the uh, planets and uh, other bodies and produced charts with these. And, you know, throughout some um, history, um, you know, she's been written into plays and literature 
And here is um, uh, an actress so portraying her uh, in, a, in a play, okay? I think the actress was someone called Mary uh, Anderson. Okay. Um, now, I've already said that she lived in um, Alexandria and she ended up in charge of the great library of Alexandria. Now, unfortunately, Alexandria at the beginning of the sort of fifth century uh, was not a good place to be. It was a city with a lot of conflict uh, between the, the Christians, the Jews and the pagans. And the fact that she taught philosophy and was able to gather these large audiences around her was viewed as being very pagan by the sort of Christian church. And in fact, she was warned by the church to stop her teaching. And one of her great friends was Orestes, who was the, uh, the governor of Alexandria. He was of sort of Roman um, origin. And it was eventually um, her association with him that would lead to her death, okay? The Archbishop mm. of Alexandria at the time was Cyril, and he was hostile to all other faiths and uh, teachings. And Cyril and Orestes were in conflict. Who controls Alexandria? Um, was it, you know, Cyril, he was the head of the main religious body? Or was it Orestes, who was in charge of the, um, you know, civil government of um, the city? And although Orestes was in fact a Christian, he didn't want to cede his power to the, uh, the, the church. And um, the struggles uh, between Orestes and Cyril came to a head following a massacre of Christians by Jewish extremists. And this happened because Cyril had led a crowd that had expelled all the Jews from the city and looted their homes and their temples. And Orestes pro um, protested to the sort of Roman um, you know, government in uh, you know, Constantinople. And eventually people tried to sort of mediate between Orestes and Cyril because, you know, no one wanted this um, horrible, you know, situation to continue. Um, but Orestes was having none of this. He refused and Cyril's attempt at reconciliation. And in fact, Cyril's monks tried to assassinate him. Now, Hypatia was very friendly with Orestes and a rumour went round the city that um, it was her that was preventing Orestes and Cyril from settling their differences. And so one day um, on the way to work, mob rule took over and um, a mob of Cyril's parishioners attacked Hypatia, they're supposed to have sort of, you know, dragged her down an alley, ripped all her clothes off. And they're supposed to have, according to one account, and quite how reliable some of these early accounts are, obviously I don't, um, I can't be certain, uh, according to one account, um, all the flesh was ripped, you know, from her uh, bones by some very sharp shells. So, you know, she was she was she was murdered. So that was the uh, the end of um, Hypatia, I'm afraid. And um, as I said, you know, throughout history, you know, you know, people have you know romanticised her, if, if you like. She's become a bit of a symbol for feminists, a martyr for pagans and atheists and a character in fiction. Um, this is um, a painting that was done of her, you know, teaching at Alexandra. I think he's a sort of 19th century um, artist. So there's Hypatia in the, the middle there with um, these sort of crowd of, you know, people around her hanging on to her every word. Uh, oh, this is Mary Anderson, okay. In the title role of a, a play called Hypatia uh, round about the year 1900. And some of you may have seen this film in more recent um, years that starred uh, Rachel Weisz, um, where, um, you know, she struggles to save the library from all of the, the Christian zealots. Um, and um, Charles Wesley also wrote um, um, a novel uh, about her, OK? So um, she has, um, you know, been featured, um, you know, quite, quite a bit, OK? So let's come forward uh, now. And um, astronomy, um, you know, as far as, as women are concerned, has been pretty much a family affair, um, you know, sort of a few hundred years ago. And I've already mentioned Caroline Herschel. I'll say a bit more about her later on. But there's Caroline and William Herschel, the famous um, sort of sister and brother of astronomy. But there's another sister and uh, brother. And um, Sophia Brahe, who lived between 1556 and 1643. Well, I don't have to tell you whose um, sister um, she was, okay? Uh, the great Tycho uh, Brahe. 
Um, she was, in fact, his younger uh, sister. And she was the youngest of 10 children in the Brahe family. They were quite a wealthy family um, because um, well, in fact, they were in the uh, nobility. Okay. And um, Tico was, in fact, 10 years her senior. Okay. And when she was about 17, she started assisting him with his uh, observations. And eventually, it was those observations that were used by uh, Kepler, you know, to formulate his theories of planetary uh, motion. And, um, you know, Ke uh, sorry, uh, Tycho's famous observatory was um, at um, Uraniburg, okay. Um, but she was also interested in other aspects of science, um, horticulture um, and medicine and chemistry. She was interested in, in all of those. And she does appear to have taught a lot of those herself. And some of the astronomy that she got involved in, um, she was teaching herself um, that, but obviously learning a lot from her um, brother. Um, but um, Sophia and Tico really formed a sort of a, an alliance because the rest of the family, they weren't too keen for them to sort of dabble in all this sort of science uh, nonsense and astronomy because they didn't deem that it was an appropriate activity for members of the aristocracy. Okay? And, um, you know, so, you know, pretty much these two were on her own. And later on, she was to resent the fact that her family didn't provide her with any um, support. Um, so she was helping um, Tico with his um, observations. She got married when she was about 19 or, or 20. And um, she had one son. But her husband died uh, probably about 13 or 14 years after they were married. And she'd moved away when she got married because her husband had had um, property somewhere. And she carried on running his um, estate after he died until their son was old enough to take over responsibility for it. And that's when, you know, she got more involved in the, the science, um, you know, the chemistry, the horticulture. But also, um, you know, where she was wasn't too far from Uraniborg, and she was able to go back there and um, visit her brother sometimes. And she helped him with, um, you know, producing um, horoscopes using, you know, charts, preparing charts of the movements of the planets and the positions of the stars. Now, um, later on, um, she met um, another nobleman who was very interested in alchemy. And his name was Eric Langer, and they became engaged in the year 1590. Um, but unfortunately, um, Langer, um, he was so keen on his experiments, he was, um, you know, wanted money all the time to sort of carry out some new experiments. And he used up a lot of Sophia's money that, you know, she'd inherited from her first husband. And so eventually, I mean, she wasn't able to get married to uh, Eric for quite some time because essentially they didn't have any money and they had to sort of flee to Germany to escape debtors. So it wasn't a very pleasant life for her. Um, but um, when eventually they did get married in 1602, okay, um, in Germany, they lived in poverty, extreme poverty for a while. She wrote a, a long letter to her sister describing how she'd had to wear stockings with holes in for her wedding. And as soon as the wedding took place, the groom's suit had to be turned to the, uh, the pawn shop because they couldn't afford to keep him, keep it. And this was when she wrote a letter expressing great anger at her family for not having supported her in any her life and her scientific um, studies, okay, for depriving her of money that was owed to her, okay. Um, Eric died um, in um, 1613. And then she decided to sort of move back to Denmark again. Um, by this time, her brother was, of course, um, he he'd moved um, to Prague. Um, but she spent the last years of her life uh, writing up um, the uh, genealogy of some Danish uh, noble families. And apparently this work has been sort of very useful to um, later you know, generations of people who are interested in the, uh, the Danish uh, nobility. Um, but, um, you know, I think more and more um, of the aid that she gave her brother in his astronomy has uh, sort of come to light. And um, in 1846, um, there was a Danish publication um, that um, said, when Denmark remembers her son Tycho, 
she should not forget the noble woman who in spirit more than blood was his sister. That shining star on our Danish sky was indeed a double star. So I think that's quite um, a striking um, memorial to her work, a recognition of the work um, that she put in, okay? So next time you hear about Tycho, Tycho, and we do a lot in astronomy, just think of uh, Sophia as well and um, some of the hardships that uh, she went through. Now, we're going to stay round about that period of time in the, well, now in the 17th century and talk about Elizabeth Hevelius, who lived between 1647 and 1693. Now, um, this is a husband and wife uh, relationship because um, Elizabeth was the second wife of the great Johannes Hevelius, one of the greatest um, astronomers of the, the 17th century. Okay. Um, you know, she did make some really, you know, good contributions to astronomy. She certainly helped um, Johannes, but it's quite an interesting um, story, actually. Um, she was actually born in Amsterdam, Elizabeth Koopman, okay, to a wealthy merchant family. But her family moved about a lot, um, and so eventually they ended up in the, uh, the Polish city of um, Danzig, which we now call Gdansk. Okay? Um, but her family were very wealthy. Okay, and um, when they got, um, you know, to uh, you know Gdansk, um, the, the young Elizabeth was fascinated by astronomy. And <coughs> this is the, hello, are you all right? Oh. Um, fine, I'm fine. Sorry about that. No, uh, no, it's all right. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine, thank you. Excellent, super. Okay. Um, the, the young Elizabeth, is, you know, was fascinated by astronomy and, um, you know, she was uh, a, a member of a, a wealthy family. And so her family um, approached uh, Johannes uh, of Alias because, as I said, you know, he's one of the all-time greats of astronomy. A great man was living here in um, Danzig. Um, and, you know, she, you know, used to go and, and talk to him as a young child about um, astronomy. And um, if we just say a bit about Hevelius, um, who lived between 1611 and 1687, um, he's called the father of lunar topography, and we'll see why in a minute, okay? Um, he described um, 10 new constellations, seven of which are still recognised today. Um, the constellation Sextans is named in honour of instruments that he lost in an observatory fire. And I think that was when he was married to um, Elizabeth. Um, he named the constellation Scutum in honour of the Polish king. Um, originally it was called Scutum Sobieski, Scutum, uh, sorry, Sobieski's shield. He discovered comets, observed sunspots, and he was even visited by Edmund Halley when um, he was in um, Gdansk. So, you know, hopefully this gives you some idea of the standing of Hevelius, but I'm sure a lot of you are already aware of that anyway, okay? And this is um, Hevelius's famous uh, map of the moon that he drew in, in 1645. Um, you know, Obviously, you know, rather artistic, I suppose, you know, from our you know, point of view, like a lot of these, um, you know, 17th and in the 18th century, um, um, you know, sky maps are as well. But nevertheless, I think it's a lovely thing. So that was his um, his moon map, okay? So Elizabeth um, married um, Hevelius in 1663 when she was 16 and he was 52. His first wife had been you know, dead for um, a number of, um, of years. And as I said, she had known him since she was quite a, a, a you know, a small child um, because, you know, they had been, you know, talking about um, astronomy. And... Um, Hevelius had a big observatory, and this observatory stretched across the, uh, um, the roofs of three houses that he owned in, um, in Danzig, okay? So essentially, it was probably one of the best observatories in the world. And, um, you know, the marriage allowed her to sort of manage his observatory and assist him with his observations. So, you know, she was helping him, but, you know, she was also fostering her own um, interests, okay? Um, they had a son who died soon after birth and three daughters who, um, you know, survived into adulthood, okay? Um, but uh, following his death in 1687, okay, so he did have quite a good long um, life, okay? 
Um, uh, up until his death, he'd be, well, they'd both been working on um, a sort of catalogue, okay, um, that was called the Prodomus Astronomiae, okay. And so she completed that and published it, and it was published in 1690, okay. And it was a catalogue of sort of 15, 1600 um, stars. Um, but there was also a sort of preface in there, and there was an atlas of the constellations. And there was also a section in the, um, the book that outlined the methodology and the technology that they've been using, okay? So examples of the sorts of instruments that they've used, the sort of sextant and the quadrant, um, how they've calculated some of the um, figures that they came up, up with. Um, you know, the star positions were recorded very carefully. Um, there were reference numbers for them. So it was a very complete, um, you know, work of um, astronomy, okay? Um, there were also sort of magnitude, um, you know, calculations or estimations, I should say, uh, in there. And, um, you know, some of these, um, you know, stars that um, they'd recorded were several new ones that, had, you know, people hadn't, um, you know, catalogued before and um, some of the new constellations that Hevelius had devised. Okay. So, um, you know, she did work, you know, extremely hard on this. It's just not, not just his, um, his catalogue. She'd put in an awful lot of, um, of work, okay. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, um, the data in this catalogue uh, was used, you know, for quite some time um, afterwards, okay. Um, now, that is her, I'm feeling that might be a death mask or, or something like that, okay, but um, she died in December 1693 at the age of 46, and she was buried in the same tomb as her husband. And um, in honour of the, the work, the, some time later, um, the French astronomer or French mathematician, Francois Araldo, he wrote of her character, a complimentary remark was always made about Madame Havelius, who was the first woman, to my knowledge, who was not frightened to face the fatigue of making astronomical observations and calculation. So her reputation has gone down um, the, uh, the centuries. Okay. So, um, you know, next time you see Havelius mentioned, then think of um, Elizabeth, okay? Right, well, on to, you know, Caroline, um, Herschel, um, you know, probably one of the um, you know, best known um, women um, uh, astronomers. And um, I'm, I'm going to, as I said, not say too much um, about her. Um, you know, she does, you know, she could warrant a whole talk on, on her own, okay, but um, I want to make you aware, as I've said before, of uh, the work of other uh, women. So what about Caroline then? Well, I think the first thing that's noticeable about her is that she lived to a good old age, doesn't she? Um, you know, she was getting on for 98 when she died. And she'd been born in Hanover in 1750, um, one of 10 children. And she was, of course, the sister of the great William Herschel, who again lived to a, a good age for the time, um, 1738 to 1822. Now, um, their father, Isaac Herschel, was an, an army uh, musician. And he was also interested in astronomy. And throughout um, a lot of her life, Caroline kept a diary um, and, you know, wrote memoirs. And um, she recalls this about um, her, her young her youth in Hanover with her father. You know, she said that what her father did was that on a clear frosty night into the street to make me acquainted with several of the beautiful constellations after we had been gazing at a comet, which was then visible. So, you know, the father really, you know, took, um, you know, Caroline and her brothers out, outside, and he was quite insistent that she did receive some sort of, um, you know, education along with her brothers. Now, maybe this wasn't a formal education like the brothers were getting, but um, he would include her in the scientific discussions that he had about um, uh, astronomy. And, you know, maybe her mother wasn't too pleased about that. She perhaps didn't think it was uh, quite the, you know, the done thing for um, a, a girl. Now, um, you know, to cut a, a long story um, short, um, William, um, the serving army musician, fled to England in 1757, um, okay? And when he came to England, um, William, you know, really started to earn his living as a musician. 
um, he ended up um, performing it, you know, composing, copying it and teaching it. So he was making quite a nice living as a, as a musician. Um, the father, um, Isaac Herschel, died in um, 1767 when Caroline was 17. And without his protection, that might be quite you know, a bit too strong a word, um, but, you know, she didn't really have a very nice life in Hanover with her mother and uh, the remaining brothers who were there. So in 1772, she joined William in England and William had to strike a deal with his mother to allow Caroline to join him because he said that um, really she needs to, if she comes to England, she, why not let her stay with me? if she can make um, a career as a soprano, because, you know, like the rest of the family, she was also musically inclined and she did have a fine singing voice. So, you know, she came to England, um, you know, William involved her with his music, um, got her some English lessons, um, but like, those old interests in maths and astronomy were still there. And um, they, um, you know, they, they both, um, you know, became interested, even more interested in astronomy than they'd, uh, they've been before and um, you know Caroline did have quite a successful singing career but um, her performances were always you know William went along as well but that's fine and eventually they end up in Bath this is a, um, um, a sort of you know picture of uh, Caroline as um, an old uh, woman she'd had smallpox when she was a young girl and apparently that had left her face scarred so she was reluctant to have a sort of a portrait painted as a time at the time so if you do see any portraits of Caroline as a young woman they weren't contemporary portraits they were done ones that were done um, a, a bit later okay so when she comes to England then and you know she becomes William's sort of assistant helps him um, with his music but also with the astronomy helps him writing down his observations and you know they both get involved in telescope making and there's uh, William there think you know, quite a famous sort of portrait of him okay and um she they um William did start making you know telescopes and was able to sell some of these as well and you know gradually they you know they're more interested in astronomy than they are in the music but the music's paying the bills of course um but all that was uh, about to change when in 1781 William discovered the planet Uranus uh, from um, his back garden in Bath, which is where they uh, ended up um, living, of course. Now, that um, William immediately, you know, shot to sort of astronomical fame with this um, discovery. And it led to his appointment by the king, who was George III, as the king's astronomer, not to be confused with the astronomer royal, of course. And the king wanted them to move um, a bit closer to London. So they, they did, they moved up to sort of the, the sort of Slough Q um, area where they had an observatory there and they were close to the king so that um, the king wanted any advice or he wanted to look through a, a telescope, then um, they, they were on hand. So um, William essentially was able to become a full-time astronomer because the position of king's astronomer carried a salary, and um, he didn't really need the income from his music anymore. So life you know, carries on, um, but it changed for Caroline when on the 1st of August, 1786, she discovered her first comet. And she discovered this when uh, William was away um, because whenever he went away, he left her in charge of the observatory. And she wasn't quite sure what to do about this discovery. She was convinced it was a comet. She observed it over several nights. And so, she, because William wasn't there, she wrote to um, a couple of his friends in the, uh, the Royal Society. And you know, much to her amazement, they were very excited by this discovery and word got to the, uh, the king. And the king decided to appoint her as assistant to the king's astronomer. And so essentially um, she was now getting paid a whole 50 pounds a year um, to do what she'd been doing before in helping uh, William. And, you know, she wrote in her diary that, you know, she was very excited by the position, but also by the money, because it was the first time she'd ever had any money of her own in her life to do what she, you know, what she decided she wanted to do with. Okay? 
And so, you know, things are looking good. Um, in 1788, William married Mary Pitt, who was um, a widow who lived just down the road um, from them. And this led to quite a, a bad time for uh, Caroline, because obviously Mary came to live with William in the house that he previously shared with Caroline. And Caroline moved down the road to her sister-in-law's house. Um, I've mentioned before that Caroline kept a diary. Well, those diaries around this time, there were sort of pages missing from them. And what people think probably happened was that Caroline was very upset by this because, um, you know, William was her life. And now it seemed to her that she was no longer part of it. So um, she must have written some pretty horrible things. Um, you know, later on, you know, the, the two women, you know, got on, you know, well. And so, you know, she probably had great regrets about what she'd written in her diary and um, uh, tore it out, okay? But um, William, um, because, uh, you know, Caroline had moved to Mary's uh, former house, William made sure that she'd got telescopes there. Um, and, you know, she was still helping him with his, um, you know, telescope building. Um, this, of course, is the sort of famous, um, you know, sort of 40 foot, um, you know, telescope that he, he had, um, you know, built there. No health and safety in those days. Is there people sort of climbing up here in the night and, um, you know, someone down the bottom there making sure that it sort of rotates properly. <laughs> but um, there, the, the Herschel Museum of Astronomy in Bath. I'm sure that you know a lot of you have probably been, um, you know, to that. Although I suspect that it's going to be some while before it receives any visitors again. I mean, if you go there, it does reflect, um, you know, the Herschel's uh, twin interests of music and um, astronomy. So well worth a visit if you haven't been there when uh, we're able to visit places like that again. So. Um, you know, she'd got her own little observatory now, but whenever William was away, um, he'd make sure that, um, you know, Caroline looked after his observatory. And between, the, 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 you know, 1786 and 1797, um, she discovered eight comets in total. So that's uh, not, not bad going, is it okay? Um, she discovered a number of nebulae, um, and she started to sort of make catalogues of star clusters and nebulae patches. And um, what she did as well was, um, and this was at William's suggestion, she took Flamsteed's um, catalogue from, you know, the earlier on in the um, 18th century. And she prepared an index to it because uh, up, up until that point there hadn't really been one. And she also included um, you know, new stars that have been discovered since uh, Flamsteed had um, done his original catalogue. So that was ex an extremely um, useful thing to do. Now, um, her nephew John was born in 1792, and there was a great bond between um, Caroline and um, John. Um, you know, when he was um, little, she used to help him set up experiments around the house. And, you know, she also helped, you know, foster his scientific um, interest before what she describes as his banish banishment to boarding school when he was about sort of eight years old. So, you know, things are, you know, carrying on for the, uh, uh, in, the in the Herschel family. Um, in 1822, William died. And Caroline felt that England, without William, you know, held nothing for her, you know, despite the fact that she'd lived here for sort of quite some in a considerable period of time. And when she first went back to Germany, she was expecting to die at any time. Um, but, you know, John used to go and visit when he could. Um, and at his suggestion, she produced a catalogue of over two and a half thousand nebulae that he and others could use. And in her old age, she started to get a lot of the recognition that had been denied her um, previously. Um, you know, she got the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society honorary membership of the, um, the Royal Society. And when John visited, when she was 83, she was obviously, you know, a very sprightly lady. He said, she runs about the town with me and skips up her two flights of stairs. In the morning till 11 or 12, she's dull and weary. Well, who's not? <laughs> but as the day advances, she gains life and is quite fresh and funny at 10 p.m. 
and sings old rhymes, nay, even dances. So she was, um, you know, keeping very active into her old age. Um, so, you know, it's, she was um, an assistant to uh, William, there's no doubt about that, but she was an invaluable assistant during his observing and his telescope making. And it's probably fair to say that he wouldn't have got as much done, you know, without her aid. But in her own right, she discovered comets and nebulae. Um, she revised existing catalogues and produced fresh ones. And, you know, it's good that she got sort of recognition in her old age. So um, it's um, just a very quick look at Caroline Herschel. Right, we're going to cross the Atlantic now and look at um, an American lady called Mariah Mitchell. And Mariah lived between 1818 and 18. 1889 and she was one of ten children so a bit like Caroline Herschel um, and she was born on Nantucket Island okay and a Quaker family okay and um, her parents like a lot of other Quakers you know valued education and insisted on giving her the same quality of education that the boys received so that was um, that was good um, but Additionally, um, you know, Nantucket Island was the centre of the American whaling fleet, the big whaling port. So it meant that, you know, women in that community probably had to have, you know, a higher degree of independence and resilience than women in a lot of other communities because the men were away for a lot of the time on the, uh, the whaling um, fleets, okay? Um, and also being a maritime community, then, you know, the average person in the street might have had a, perhaps a, a, a better um, than average uh, knowledge of astronomy and navigation, you know, compared to the sort of land lubbers, um, um, you know, inland, okay. So um, it was it was that sort of, uh, you know, community. She went to local schools, okay. Um, her father even opened up his own school and she was a student there and then a teaching assistant. But her father was very interested in astronomy and um, he got his own telescope, so she was able to use that. And at the age of 12 and a half, she was helping her father in some of his calculations uh, concerning eclipses. Um, her father's school closed and then um, she decided to open up her own school um, after she finished her formal education. And this was a school with a bit of a difference for the time because um, she allowed non-white children to attend the school. And that's quite a controversial move in that uh, you know, sort of community because the local public school was still segregated at the time. Um, so she you know, opened up her own school, taught there for a while, and then she was offered a job um, working in the, um, the local library. She was the first librarian there. And she ended up working there for 20 years. Well, okay, so she's doing a bit of amateur astronomy. So why is she so prominent, okay? Well, on October the 1st, 1847, um, she was the second, or I've seen other references now that might suggest she might be the third, but anyway, she was one of the first women um, after Caroline Herschel to discover a comet. Well, that's good, isn't it? You know, so what? Well, um, what happened was that, now I'm not quite sure how well you can see this, but some years before, uh, the King of Denmark, um, who was Frederick VI, he'd previously offered um, a gold medal to the value of 20 ducats to be given to the first discoverer of a comet, not of known revolution, nor visible to the naked eye, subject to sort of various uh, conditions. Okay, So um, it had to be a comet that no one had found before, and a telescopic uh, comet. Now, Mariah's father, he, he knew of this uh, uh, medal um, and he wrote to you know Professor Bond at the Harvard Observatory and Professor Bond sent um, you know a letter off um, to the you know committee who um, were in charge of um, the awarding of this medal um, so so that's good however um, a slight sort of um, um, flaw in the plan um, was that um, about two or three days later, so Mariah had discovered her comet on October the 1st. On October the 3rd, 1847, a father Francesco de Vico in Italy also discovered the same comet. 
Now he was in Europe and obviously word of his discovery reached the awarding committee a long time before uh, Mariah's did. Um, so he was initially awarded the, uh, the medal. Um, and, um, but when um, you know, Professor Bond's letter um, arrived, um, it became clear that um, the, the medal should go to Mariah and she was subsequently uh, awarded it, okay? Um, the inscription on the medal says, not in vain do we watch the setting and rising of uh, the stars, okay? Now, if you're thinking, well, I want to discover a comet, I want that gold medal, um, tough, um, because um, some years later, oh, hang on, sorry, some years later, a notice appeared that the editor has been requested by Professor Shoemaker to announce that the King of Denmark cannot, in the present embarrassed situation of that country, confirm the Comet Medal established by his predecessors. And consequently, no more medals can be awarded for comets discovered since the death of King Christian um, VIII. Okay, so tough. If you discover a comet, you're not going to get a medal, okay? But Okay, so, um, you know, Mariah's discovered this uh, comet and, you know, that's absolutely um, uh, brilliant, but it didn't really lead to any, you know, change in her employment. She was still working at the library. Um, she did get elected to various um, um, astronomical, you know, associations and scientific societies in the, um, in, in the US. And she was also doing a lot of sort of calculation work for the US uh, Nautical Almanac, okay? Um, but the turning point uh, comes um, in 1865 when she's made Professor of Astronomy at Vassar College. And this was a college that was set up by Matthew Vassar, who had emigrated to the US uh, from this country. And I think he'd made his fortune in brewing. Um, beer and astronomy seem to sort of go together quite a bit, actually. Um, so, you know, she goes off and becomes, you know, Professor of Astronomy there and director of the Vassar College Observatory. And, um, you, know, you know, Vassar was an, an all women's um, uh, college. And she really got the students engaged in, um, you know, thinking for themselves. That's what she wanted to, you know, train people as. Um, she ended up, you know, taking them to an eclipse expedition to Colorado in 1878. So that's from the East Coast across to the Rocky Mountains. That would have been quite an undertaking um, then, you know, all their equipment as, as well. And when she started at Vassar, you know, what, what sort of work was she going to do? What sort of research? And she really decided upon a big data collection exercise um, whereby, you know, she'd get the students to make, um, you know, measurements of, say, the number of sunspots, the positions of comets, the positions of, uh, uh, you know, planetary satellites, and then, um, you know, use the sort of mathematics to, you know, make predictions about the motion of um, these these objects. Okay, and there's uh, Mariah there with um, some of the uh, people at Vassar. That was her first um, first astronomy class there, and there's uh, Mariah there with um, the, um, the the telescope there. I'm not sure who. The woman on the right is and there this is the um, observatory with um you know is that croquet i'm not sure actually but um, that looks really nice doesn't it if i could travel back in a time machine I can, I can see myself there actually and vassar college's website this is, is on there at the moment it says the hands-on approach to astronomy at vassar was shaped by mariah mitchell America's first woman astronomer and the first director of the college observatory. She was famous for pushing her students to think for themselves, do their own research, come to their own conclusions. She believes that students work best when they're part of a supportive community. And that's what they still try to do today at uh, Vassar. Um, if you're interested in um, this, then her life letters and journals are um, online as part of Project Gutenberg. And it does, in fact, include an account of a visit to the home of uh, Sir John Herschel, because um, uh, once she got her appointment at Vassar, she was able to sort of, you know, travel to uh, Europe. 
Now, on to the Harvard College Observatory. And again, I'm going to cut a very long story uh, short here. But um, the Harvard College Ob Observatory had been um, sort of founded in the, um, the you know, during the, the first part of the sort of 19th century. William Bond, who Mariah's father's letter was sent to about the discovery of a comet. Um, he was the first astronomical observer um, there and essentially established the Harvard College Observatory in 1839. And um, over the years, they you know, picked up in equipment. And um, in 1880, Edward Pickering was appointed as director of the Harvard College Observatory. And you can see that he was at the helm for you know, nearly 40 years. Okay? And um, he really developed it into a major research institution. Um, he established um, photographic and spectroscopic um, surveys of um, uh, the stars, um, covering both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, because an outstation was um, established at a place called Arequipa, which is in um, uh, Peru. I noticed that was in the news this week. I think they had some bad flooding there or something. But also, he encouraged young people in astronomy, um, women and men, but I think it's more for the sort of women um, that he's um, you know, probably remembered these days. And these, of course, are the famous Harvard computers and he employed you know, many women. But they were performing um, you know, things like you know, measuring and calculations using images from some of these great glass plates um, that um, the men, of course, have been instrumental in um, you know, taking the images, observing at the telescope to, um, to get those. Okay. And his staff, um, you know, that's a rather unfortunate uh, name for them um, uh, these days, okay. But a lot of these went on to make, um, you know, some very significant contributions. And again, I'm just going to skim over these because it really is another talk in itself, okay. But some of these names you will be very familiar with, and I'm sure you will know a lot about um, these, um, these women. Um, Wilhelmina Fleming, um, she was actually born in Scotland. And um, she emigrated to Boston um, in Massachusetts with her husband. Um, and but when you know she got there, um, you know he he left her, and she found herself um, you know with a, a very young child. And she got a job um, as a, um, a, a sort of maid, really, in the Pickering household. Um, but Wilhelmina had actually worked um, in, as a, a school teacher um, when she was you know well very young, you know far younger than you expect your teachers to be these days. She was a very intelligent woman. And one day the story goes that Pickering was so exasperated by the inefficiency of one of his male assistants at the um, Harvard College Observatory. He said that even my maid could do a better job of the computing. But he picked up on the fact that, you know, Wilhelmina was a very bright woman. So that's how she got a job at the Harvard College Observatory. And she was really, you know, one of the, the first of a number of women that Pickering brought to work at the observatory by day to work on the plates that the men had exposed at night. And um, one thing that um, Fleming and um, you know, Pickering did was they devised a, what we might regard these days really as a sort of fairly primitive um, system of classifying um, stellar spectra. Um, but it was a forerunner of what was to come. So, you know, they were looking at the, um, the spectra of um, stars and they're putting them into various categories, really classifying them according to the appearance and the positions of the lines. And they set up with this really alphabetical category, A, B, C, D, etc. And in nine years, apparently she catalogued more than 10,000 stars. Um, and um, eventually, um, you know, she... Um, she became what was called the um, curator of astronomical photographs there. She was in charge of all the, uh, the famous um, uh, glass plates. So Wilhelmina Fleming initiated the, um, a system for classifying stellar spectra. And, you know, she was essentially in charge of hiring and firing some of the other women there. One of the other women that was taken on um, was Henrietta uh, Levitt, who, again, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. And she, her name is synonymous with the period luminosity law, um, which enables us to sort of calculate the, um, the distances 
to um, you know, stars. And what she'd been working on was um, variable stars in the Cepheid class in the Magellanic Clouds. And she found that there was a direct correlation between the apparent brightness of the Cepheid and the period of its variability. And she was able to recognise this because, say, if you're looking at all the stars, say, in the small cloud, essentially they're all at the same distance uh, from the Earth. Um, and so there did seem to be this connection. It's worthy of notice that the brighter the variables have the longer periods. And while she was doing this work, she discovered getting on for two and a half thousand variables, the fantastic numbers of stars that uh, these women are, are classifying. And there was a Harvard College Observatory in March 1912, the following statement regarding the periods of 25 variable stars in the small Magellanic Cloud has been prepared by Miss Levitt. It says a remarkable relation between the brightness of these variables and the length of their periods will be noticed. Okay, so this is the famous period luminosity law. And again, to cut a very long st story short, um, it's an important yardstick for measuring distances, enabled distances to stars and galaxies to be measured. And Edwin Hubble used it in the 1920s to, um, you know, measure the, um, you know, distance to the uh, Andromeda galaxy and also, you know, to other, um, you know, galaxies um, as part of his work to show that um, the universe was expanding. So a very, very important um, discovery. And in fact, in 1925, a Swedish mathematician, uh, Lettler, considered nominating her for the Nobel Prize, um, her work on pe the period luminosity law, but she died in 1921, and Nobel Prize is awarded posthumously. But I'm sure had she been alive, it would have been a very worthy nomination. And the only other Harvard lady I'm just going to mention is Annie Jump Cannon. Um, she started uh, at Harvard um, in 1896, and again, she was working on the classification of spectra. And throughout her life, now she's got to be the champion, surely, she classified more than 225,000 stars. Um, when um, Wilhelmina Fleming died, Annie Cannon took over as the curator of astronomical photographs. And in 1938, she actually became professor of astronomy. She got an honorary degree from Oxford and the photo shows her in her robes for that um, award. And there's a picture of her sitting in her office. It's amazing when you look at offices like that these days, you know, these, these old chairs there, carpet on the floor, um, you know, where's the computer? Where's the phone and that, you know, how peaceful that probably would have, have been. But, you know, I suspect though, you know, she's just got piles of stellar spectra everywhere. And, uh, you know, the computer would have made your life so much easier, Annie. Okay. Now, again, to just cut a very long story short, she carried on, uh, or some of the work she did carried on where, um, you know, Pickering and, and Fleming had, had looked, um, had, 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 well, left off. She carried, carried on from them. And she looked at these um, categories that they had for classifying stellar spectra. And in the light of other knowledge as well, she was able to um, organize um, these so that um, it really reflected a color sequence, which we now know is a temperature sequence, okay? So she ordered them like that. She got rid of some of the uh, categories that um, Pickering and Mrs. Fleming had done as well, because you know she recognized that um, you know, perhaps there's an overlap between them. And she, she came up with this sequence, O, B, A, F, G, K, N, for you know, stellar spectra. Here you've got the very hot, sort of, you know, white blue stars. Down here you've got the cooler red ones. So, you know, the message is here. Next time you see a stellar spectral classification, think of Annie Cannon, because it was her that, um, you know, came up with this um, sequence that we use today. And um, this is a picture of some of the uh, computers there in the 1890s. Um, You've got Henrietta Lubitz there, there's Henriette Fleming and Annie Cannon on the, the far right, okay? So this New England magazine, um, that's something if you're interested in, um, I suppose, Americana of, um, you know, the 19th 
late 19th century. If you look in, in that, there are some you know, very interesting articles there. Um, Cecilia Payne um, de Poshkin. Um, Cecilia uh, was born in, in this country. Um, she studied at um, Cambridge and originally she started off um, really studying things like botany. Um, but in 19, um, I suppose it must have been 1920, something like that, while she was an undergraduate there, um, she heard a lecture by Arthur Eddington talking about his famous um, 1919 um, eclipse trip, the light bending um, uh, trip. And that really, you know, got her in with astronomy. She was so excited afterwards that that's when she resolved to be an astronomer. And a, a, a bit later on, she was at a meeting in London and she was introduced to Harlow Shapley, who by that time had succeeded Pickering as director of the Harvard College Observatory. And he got to, they got talking. And basically, he, you know, said to her, well, look, you know, if you ever want to come and do some research, you know, come to Harvard. And she realised once she graduated that probably the only, um, you know, prospect for her uh, would be in ending up being a teacher. So she went to Harvard and that's where she stayed for the rest of her career. And that's her on the boat going off to um, America in 1923. Um, and... Um, there's a picture of her with a couple of her children who um, a couple of them went on. Certainly one of the boys, um, I think it's Edward, uh, went on to become a famous scientist. And that's her husband, uh, Sergei um, Goposhkin. She was born Cecilia Payne, of course. Okay. And, um, you know, her achievements really are quite um, uh, remarkable. Um, she was the first person to earn a PhD in astronomy at um, Harvard. And Otto Struve said it was undoubtedly the most brilliant PhD thesis ever written in astronomy. Well, what was in this thesis then? Well, in this thesis, she was accurately able to relate spectral classes to temperature. And again, she was able to do this by taking the work of others um, and, and building on that. And she also established hydrogen as the major element in stars. Now, unfortunately for her, um, the person who was examining her thesis was um, the great American astronomer, Henry Norris Russell. And Norris was a bit, um, Henry Norris Russell was a bit old school. He wasn't going along with any of this nonsense that um, hydrogen was the major element in the universe. After all, we've got, you know, samples of meteorites. We could analyse those, you know, where was the hydrogen in those? Um, and so she had to sort of, if you like, tone down some of her conclusions in her thesis so that um, Henry Norris Russell would be um, happy with it. But a few years later, he realised she was right. And, um, you know, he you know, was essentially championing this idea then that um, hydrogen was the major element in the stars and in the universe. Um, so 1934, she married Sergei Goposhkin, got three children. But life at Harvard was always a bit of an uphill struggle. Um, in 1938, she was given the title of astronomer, but it wasn't until 1956 that she became the first female tenured professor at Harvard and later its first head of department. Um, as I've just mentioned, her early career was the sort of spectroscopic studies, but later in, in her career, she became interested in variable stars. Um, because um, her husband was working on those as well, so they were able to work together. And some people always felt that that was a bit of a waste that um, she hadn't carried on with some of this sort of, you know, quite pioneering stuff that she'd done in her early career. Um, she was the author of many, uh, you know, popular books like Stars in the Making, which I've got a copy of somewhere, um, and, you know, obviously highly technical publications as well. Um, but as I said, she always felt that, um, you know, being a a woman astronomer at Harvard, um, you had to be you know, better than your male colleagues to um, succeed. Um, obviously, I'm just keeping an eye on the, the time here. Um, you know, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, um, obviously, you know, Joc you know Dame Jocelyn uh, Bell Burnell, I should say, I suppose, um, still, you know, very much um, with us. And um, one of the very prominent figures in, in sort of British science, not just sort of 
women in, in science, isn't it? Okay. And um, this is a picture of her at sort of Cambridge in the 1960s. Um, she was born in um, Northern Ireland and her father was the architect who helped design the Armagh Planetarium. And, um, you know, sometimes when he used to go and visit the planetarium, he'd take her with him and uh, she'd get talking to the astronomers there. Um, after she graduated from Glasgow, um, she went to Cambridge to do her PhD and she worked with Anthony Hewish there. Um, they built a radio telescope um, looking for quasars, which had been you know, discovered earlier early on in the 1960s, okay. And she detected what she called scruff on chart recording paper that could be tracked across the sky, okay. And these were found to be regular radio pulses just coming from the same single point, okay. And the one that she found, first of all, um, you know, was, was pulsing at the rate of about one pulse per second. And at first, no one knew what, what these were, you know. And even, you know, they, they were temporarily dubbed little green men. Um, but now, of course, we know they were pulsars and rapidly rotating neutron stars. And it's the end of the road for, um, you know, some of the most massive stars that we, we see in the, the, the universe. And after finishing her PhD, she worked at sort of various um, universities in, um, you know, this country. She's also been a visiting professor um, at um, institutions in um, other countries. Um, and of course, you know, it's well known that um, Hewish um, was awarded or he shared the Nobel Prize for Physics um, with Martin Ryle for, um, and Hewish's contribution was the discovery of, um, of pulsars. Um, and, you know, some people have always, um, you know, made a point of the fact that um, she didn't receive the recognition for this. I mean, some things I've read that, you know, said that she's not bothered about it, well, which I'm sure is very sort of gracious of her. But other times, you know, people are saying, you know, she was the student, Hewish was the supervisor, Nobel Prizes are awarded to the supervisor. I don't know. It's, um, you know, there we are. But, I mean, I think you know, it's fair to say that... Um, you know, her work and her herself, you know, had a, a lot of, um, you know, recognition, um, you know, since since then, okay? So, um, it, and I think she's worked at, you know, these various institutions, she's worked in virtually every region of the electromagnetic spectrum as well. Um, in June 2007, she um, became a Dane commander of the Order of the British Empire. And um, in 2013, um, she was assessed as one of the 100 most powerful women in the UK by Woman's Hour on um, Radio 4. So um, there, there we go. So, um, you know, as I said, um, you know, figure she, she's often on the radio and the television, isn't she? So um, it's, uh, it's very good to see. Um, someone who died, sadly, this year during the first lockdown, I think, was Margaret Burbage, another British astronomer who worked in America. There's uh, Margaret Burbage and her husband, Jeffrey, again, another Brit who uh, ended um, up in, in the US, okay. And I think, you know, one of the most famous things that the Burbages are famous for was the, the B squared FH paper, which described um, the nucleosynthesis of the chemical elements in stars. So we saw that, um, you know, Cecilia Payne had said, hydrogen is the major constituent of all stars. Where do the other chemical elements come from. Um, well, the Burbages and Foyler and Howell, um, you know, wrote this paper describing a series of reactions that could go on um, at star stars in various stages of their evolution, okay. And um, the Burbages al also made, you know, prominent contributions to the study of quasars. Um, but she did come back to this country for a while in the 1970s when she was director of the Greenwich Observatory, but um, she went back to the US. But are there any more? Well, again, I'm just going to throw some names at you because looking at the time and also, um, um, you know, you can go off and do your own research and discover some of these women. Sandra Faber, um, she looks at the formation and evolution of galaxies and co-discoverer of the Great Attractor. Um, she is still at the Lick Observatory, and I know that because um, one of the former members of our Leicester Society well, he, he joined us as a lad, and he's now, I think, in his, um, um, he must be in his, his 40s. He works at the uh, Lick Observatory, and we had 
we've had a couple of Zoom link ups with him recently. Um, and he started talking about Sandy. So he's on first name terms with her. She's still there. I'm impressed with that. I'm very easily starstruck, actually. Um, but yes, yeah, she's still working there. She worked on the design of the Keck telescope. And there's her with a, um, well, a, a former American um, president, shall we say, who, you know, perhaps hasn't um, knew how to behave, shall we say. <laughs> okay. But anyway, that's her with President Obama. Margaret Geller. Um, Maps is maps the distribution of dark matter in the universe. Um, you know, she's um, looked at how galaxies clump together and how this can help us understand how the universe has evolved. Okay, and you know, she discovered this feature called the Great Wall. Okay, this great cluster of galaxies. I think that's been, um, if I'm if I'm probably sort of bigger than that now, I think they're okay, but um, the um, you know, this clustering of galaxies that's occurred. So there's Margaret Geller, Eleanor Halin, um, you know, right about well, just over 10 years ago, um, asteroid and comet discoverer, um, near Earth asteroid tracking, made some prominent contributions there. Helen Sawyer, um, I think she was born in the US, but ended up in Canada because she married a, a, a Canadian. But, you know, in the early days, she worked with Harlow Shapley and Annie Cannon looking at stars in or variables in globulars. Now, Jane Lu, um, Vietnamese um, refugee, her father um, had worked as um, with the um, American military in, um, in Vietnam as a translator. And then when the South Vietnamese government fell in the 1970s, of course, um, that wasn't the place to stay if you'd worked with the American military. So Jane and um, her family fled to the US when she first got there. She couldn't speak any um, English, but you know, she, she learnt, of course. And then um, she um, you know, went through the American educational system. She won a scholarship to uh, Stanford University. She worked at the JPL. And what she's famous for though, um, she's the co-discoverer with David Jewett, another Briton who spent his career in the US. Um, on the first Kuiper Belt object way back in 1992 now, okay? Um, so that's, um, um, you know, Jane um, Liu. Um, Carolyn Pork, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. Um, she became um, the leader of the imaging team of the Cassini mission to Saturn. Um, you know, an expert on the rings of Saturn and the moon Enceladus. She's investigated the spokes within the rings of Saturn. But she's fascinated by the 1960s and the Beatles. There's a picture of the Cassini imaging team at Abbey Road in London, led by Carolyn Corco. Uh, there she is. So again, she's been named one of the most 25 influential people in space by Time magazine. And I presume that means working in the space industry rather than in space per se. And Vera Rubin, um, she did this pioneering work on the sort of um, rotation rates of galaxies, which provides evidence of dark matter. Or, but I know that, you know, dark matter is a controversial, um, you know, subject. You know, some people think that there is another explanation, um, you know, for this, maybe our sort of theories about gravity need tweaking. Um, and in fact, Vera Rubin, you know, probably herself wasn't too, um, you know, convinced by this idea that, um, you know, this universe filled with a new kind of stuff particle. Because she said, if I could have my pick, I would like to learn that Newton's laws must be modified in order to correctly describe gravitational inter interactions at large distances. That's more appealing than a universe filled with a new kind of sub nuclear particle. Well, one day we might know. And as I'm sure some of you know, um, you know, well, a year or so ago, um, the Large Synoptic Survey um, you know, Telescope um, was renamed after the Vera C. Rubin Observatory um, in recognition of her contribution to dark matter and her, um, uh, you know, she equal treatment and representation of women in science, okay? Right, so just very briefly then, sorry, I hope I've just got uh, five more minutes, if that's okay. Can that's you name fine. any... Oh, good, right, okay. Can anyone name any female astronomers from Yorkshire? I think, as I said earlier on, I haven't quite drawn a blank, I would say, but there weren't as many as I thought there would be. But 
Anyone know of any? No, Anyone? I don't. I don't think so. Right. Okay. Well, one of them technically isn't an astronomer. She's an astronaut. Helen Sharman. I could hear you shout from here. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, I mean, Helen Sharman, a, a bit of professional interest here from my point of view. You know, you, you know, she's a chemist um, who became the first British astronaut and the first Western European woman in space. Okay, the first British cosmonaut, if you like, um, and the first woman to visit the Mir space station back in May 1991. Was it really that long ago? Okay, um, I'm sure you all know that uh, you know she ended up working as a chemist for the Mars Company dealing with the sort of, um, you know, chocolate. And of course, once she'd got, um, it was, you know, it was known that she was going into space, okay. Um, the press, of course, labelled her the girl from Mars, of course. Um, and, um, but, you know, Helen, you know, Sharman um, has, you know, gone on to, um, you know, do a lot of work to sort of, um, you know, outreach work, um, you know, promoting, you um, well, not only women, but, you know, young people in, in science as well. She's a very good ambassador. I think the last thing I heard, she was working in the um, um, chemistry department at Imperial College. Yes, she was the operations uh, manager there. OK, I think she also appeared as herself in the Channel 4 soap opera um, Hollyoaks. Not that I've watched that, though, so uh, I, I didn't know that until um, earlier on. OK. Um, and um, in fact, the last time I saw her was just before the first lockdown, because uh, back in March um, at the National Space Centre here in Leicester, they had like the British Space Festival and members of the Astronomical Society were out in the car parks, broad daylight with telescopes, cloudy, of course, hoping to do some sunspot watching. And then across the car park, Helen Sharman and Tim Peake are walking together. OK, so um, that was um, that, that was good. But um there we are. So Helen Sharman, um, her space suit is actually in the National Space Centre here in um, Leicester. And um, I gather that's the, the Sheffield um, um, Star of Fame it's all, or Walk of, or Star Walk of Fame or, or whatever they call it. Sheffield Legends. OK. Helen Sharman, um, OBE. I think she's been promoted since then. Yeah, she's got. Um, oh, no. No, she's still OBE to be changed, actually. But uh, now, the other person I'm going to uh, just mention in passing, um, again, it's a bit of a tenuous link, um, but is this lady here, Mary Parsons, Countess of Ross, 1813 to 1885. She was born in Yorkshire, okay, born in Heaton in Yorkshire. I don't know if anyone has ever been to Heaton or knows it or anything like that, but, you know, she was an amateur astronomer and pioneer photographer. And in 1836, she married Lord Oxmanton, who in 1841 became the third Earl of Ross, Burr Castle fame, etc. And there's Mary Parsons uh, there, and there's a photograph of her. There's her sitting down with someone else, I can see, looking at some photographs. Okay. Um, but she was also, um, she'd got some skills as a blacksmith. And it's reckoned that when um, they were building the um, you know, the telescope at uh, Burt Castle, the great Leviathan of Parsons Town. Um, she was using her sort of, um, you know, blacksmithing skills uh, on that. She actually built, you know, part of the, um, the structure. And this is a picture I like here. Now, she's not on this picture. She's, uh, she took the picture, but it shows three of her children. And I think that's her niece there. And when I first looked at this, um, I thought, well, three children, I can see two boys and a girl. But yeah, the other the other child is down there. I didn't notice that at first. But that's great. Wouldn't that be great to sit um in the um you know in the, the sort of the front near the um you know the, the, the business end where the light comes down of that great telescope at Burr Castle and you can see some of the famous stonework there, okay. Um but I think that's and that's um obviously a a, a colour, you know, painting of her. Um, but I'm afraid that's all I've been able to come up with, with um, women astronomers from um, Yorkshire. But um, I'm sure, um, you know, if you do enough uh, sort of, you know, delving around, I'm sure there must be um, uh, more of them. OK. Well, I've, I've, I've been through that, you know, very um, quickly. And as I said, in, in places, I've cut some sort of 
uh, extremely long and interesting stories short. But um, I hopefully I've you know pointed out to you at least one or two names that you weren't familiar with um, uh, before. Um, so um, I hope you found it interesting, and I hope it encourages you to uh, you know perhaps go away and find out about some of these women um, yourself. Well, thank you very much, Anne. Uh, that was a very uh, informative um, talk, and you've certainly uh, expanded my knowledge of uh, women in astronomy. Um, so we've come on to that part of the evening where we ask for questions. Uh, as usual, wave at me, or preferably put up a, a digital hand, and um, you can ask a question. So. Roy Gunson's waving at me. So, Roy, will you unmute yourself, please? And your it's question. A, it's just really an observation on uh, Wilhelmina Fleming. Uh, she's also, apart from the spectra, she's also noted for actually being the discoverer of the Horsehead Nebula, which she spotted on a, a photographic plate. Mm -hmm. Um, it mentions that uh, in a newspaper article that she discovered some new stars, which was actually white dwarfs. Uh, she, she, she noticed that they were a new, a different type of star, and they, they turned out to be the white dwarfs. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know. I knew about the Horsehead Nebula, but I didn't know about the white dwarfs. That's interesting. Thank you. OK, thank you, Roy. Have we got any other uh, questions? Uh, Michael Poxon. Michael, can you unmute, please? Oh, I think I'm on mute. Um, uh, there's one more name I'd, I'd like to throw at you. Um, she she was one of the sort of I think she was one of the ladies at Harvard and uh, Mariah Mitchell, lady by the name of Dorit Toflight. Um, oh yes, yes. She, she discovered loads and loads of variable stars, and in fact, in in 2015, I was at a conference in Boston and I met her and she was such a lovely lovely lady you know she was kind of like everyone's grandma yeah she was super um yeah and and one other one other point about uh Williamina Fleming on the on the subject of variable stars she discovered SS Cygni which is one of the it's it's been it, basically it's been followed by by variable star observers ever since she discovered it in 1896 yeah. So yeah, there's some pretty, some pretty formidable ladies in that group in the harem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, yeah, Dorit Hoflight. I think yes, she. Um, I think she is in a, another version I've got of this talk. You know, I, I sort of you know pick and choose according to the sort of uh, the sort of mood I'm in. But she lived to a great age as well, I believe, didn't she? Yeah, she she she, yeah. she only died about three two or three years ago. Yeah, I think. Mm. yeah she was a lovely lady. Thank you. Uh, just a question about uh, in the modern world, why there are so uh, few women uh, in science in general and in astronomy. Uh, and as it happens, I was just looking at some figures about um, the take up of A-level maths uh, currently. Uh, what do you think we can do to encourage uh, women, uh, young girls, whilst they're at school, uh, and uh, in education to go into the sciences and especially into astronomy? Um, well, I, I know it's a long time since I was at school, but I went to an all girls school. Um, and, you know, obviously, I, I don't think there was any, um, you know, people were just able to sort of follow their, their sort of interests um, uh, then. Um, I think that. Um, you know, particularly with what's going on at the moment with the, uh, you know, the pandemic and the development of, um, you know, vaccines. I think that is encouraging a lot of sort of younger people in general to look at, um, um, you know, science courses. Uh, my day job, I work at um, Leicester College, um, which is a further education college, and I'm in charge of uh, what's called the Access to Science course, which is a course for adults who um, are returning, you know, to study. And, um, you know, they do this one year, very intensive course to, you know, get into uh, uh, university. And I get an awful lot of, you know, women on that um, looking at careers, you know, particularly things like, you know, biomedical, you know, sciences and, and that. And um, I think that um, 
I don't think there, I mean, it doesn't seem to me there are the, the sort of barriers, um, you know, these days, um, you know, quite so much. Um, but I think that, you know, you know, particularly when people watch the television now, um, I think that, you know, some of the presenters that you, you see on there, um, I suppose Alice Roberts, Roberts um, is it Liz Bonin, um, and, um, you know, Maggie Adderin, you know, Pocock, um, I think women are given, being given more of a sort of presence on, on science uh, programmes now, aren't they? And I think that might encourage, uh, uh, you know, girls and, and women to get into that because, you know, if they watch these programmes that they're interested in and, you know, if there are, you know, women on there, then, it, you know, think, yeah, I can do that. Good. Okay. I mean, I think, though, that, you know, whatever, you know, people want, you know, boys or, or girls, you know, just in, encourage them in, you know what they want to do because um you know they, they've got to study something they're going to be working in that field for the rest of their life it's got yeah. to be something that they're interested in whether it's the science maths or the arts okay we're getting lost in our own little conversation here and we better <laughs> we, we better include the rest of the group so uh uh has anybody else got any questions i'm looking around uh, i'm just going to check across the whole Group, nobody's waving at me. Not even young Louis. Oh, Paul, Paul. Oh, sorry. Paul, I've not got a question, but I, I, I would say I've, I've met Helen Sharman at Sheffield University. I saw one of her lectures quite a few years ago now. I think it was in the na late 90s, and she was an absolute brilliant speaker, and she was a really nice person. And I got my photograph with her shaking oh. hands as well. Really nice. Other points I'd like to make is. Uh, I've been to Herschel's house in Bristol and I was really surprised how young the house looks. Say it's 250, 300 years old, the house looks really quite new. But I was disappointed with the stuff inside the house. Say it's a museum, they had very, very few artifacts from Herschel's period. So while I found it interesting and really good, I also found it a little bit disappointing because of the, the lack of stuff that was inside, but I just thought that'd be a nice comment. That's you, that's just you, Phil. You're always wanting to probe around to the foundation. And, uh, well, I've got, got, got a lo yes. lovely when wooden telescope. Go there? Because um, oh, I've been 90s. a number of times and each time I've been, it's different. And oh, okay. I think it's like a lot of these um, places, they, uh, well, again, um, I hope no one here works in a museum or anything like that, but <laughs> sometimes it's almost people dumb things down, so it's all got to be sort of button pressing, hasn't it? And I just wonder if they've done that yet at, at the Herschel House, um, because uh, I say it is sometimes since I've been there. Yeah, I, I saw the uh, eight inch uh, wooden telescope that he had. Uh, I'm a bit surprised. It was a, a octagonal tube made out of oak. So uh, it, it, it were good, it was nice. Uh, I think he actually made it himself, didn't he? Mm, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, when that's this would work. Yeah, yeah, it was it was, it was good. I, I, I thought there'd be more stuff from his period of what he'd done and maps and that kind of stuff. But anyway, it was nice visiting. Yeah, yeah I okay. think they just expand on the gift shop, don't they, rather than the, sometimes <laughs> yeah. the exhibit. On the way out. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, sorry, I'm being a bit cynical there. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Uh, You're welcome. Robbie. Roy was waving at me. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a couple of points. I mean, one, carrying on from what Phil was saying, uh, the Herschel house, uh, Caroline Herschel, uh, when I went there, they'd got um, some of her clothes on a, a pedestal. She was only about four foot six. She was very tiny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A very tiny lady, which was, was quite surprising. I mean, it almost like children's clothes that, uh, that they'd got on there. And the other thing is, um, Anne mentioned the... Uh, the uh, book on uh, Maria Mitchell on the Gutenberg Press. I, I think I read it a couple of years ago, or part of it, and some of it um, as part of her diary. And she was, I mean, I, th I was amazed at what she did in a day. I mean, apparently it was something like she got up at six o'clock, uh, made up the fires, baked some bread, went to open the library up, uh, served the customers in the library, came home from lunch, did some work on some comet orbits, went back to the library, opened it up again, served customers, went home, prepared an evening meal. And then she went out observing until two, three o'clock in the morning. And she was actually calculating uh, by hand 
the orbits of new comets just from observations. I mean, we have computers that do that today. I mean, mm -hmm. I wouldn't know where to start. From. <laughs> it's amazing what she put into a day. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not just she just did the one job. She did about five jobs. I, I, I was, I was yeah. incredibly amazed at what she, she actually did in a day. Yeah. That sounds incredible, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, that's right. I mean, at the risk of, um, uh, I hope no one's going to take offence at this, but um, it was all, almost reminded me of like that Monty Python sketch about the four Yorkshiremen, almost, you know, <laughs> what she was doing then, doesn't it? So, uh, <laughs> you know, did this and did that and then, uh, you know. But uh, no, I mean, yes, she, she worked incredibly hard, but yeah. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not seeing anybody else wanting to ask a question. Uh, so what we'll do is in our usual next Sprint Swinton manner, we will thank Anne for an excellent talk. Thank you very much, Anne. And okay. hopefully we can get together in person and you can visit the observatory because we've updated it since you All were right. still. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you okay. very much and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. A lovely audience. Thank, thank you very you. much.